Welcome to our January 6, 2019 service from La Jolla Presbyterian Church. Today is Epiphany Sunday. Reverend Scott Mitchell is preaching and is looking at the visit of the wise men to baby Jesus. The scripture is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. We're looking this morning at the Gospel of Matthew, second chapter, first 12 verses. And this passage from, from Matthew records the visitation of the wise men to Bethlehem. Listen to and for the word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, just ask that you open your word up to us this morning, that you speak to us, each of us, in the individual way that we need and corporately as a body who follows you. So guide us this morning as we look at this wonderful passage. Pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Here's what the internet says about it. <clears throat> Would you rather is a conversation or a party game that poses a dilemma in the form of a question beginning with, would you rather? The dilemma might be between two good options, such as, would you rather be completely invisible for one day or have the power of flight for one day? Then again, you might have to pick between two bad choices, such as, would you rather be locked in a room that is constantly dark for a week or a room that is constantly bright for a week. When you decide to play the game of would you rather, indecision is not an option. You have to choose one of the two options if you, if you decide to play it. Here's several more. Would you rather lose all of your money and valuables or all of the pictures you have ever taken? Would you rather be famous when you are alive and forgotten when you die, or unknown when you are alive but famous after you die? Would you rather be the first person to explore a planet or be the inventor of a drug that cures a deadly disease? Would you rather the general public think you are a horrible person but your family be very proud of you, or your family think of you as a horrible person <laughs> but the general public be very proud of you? Of course, there's always, would you rather have money or fame? And then I like this one. Would you rather be alone for the rest of your life or always be surrounded by annoying people? <laughs> <clears throat> if, uh, if that is your reality already, just see me after the service. <laughs> As you can see, the game can be very fun or it can be kind of downright mean and nasty. And it has some darker versions that we won't get into, but... 
Despite any negatives, the core of genius to this game is this. It does not give you the option of indecision. If you commit to playing this game, you absolutely have to make a choice. So this morning, we're going to explore a couple of would-you-rathers that I will reveal as we go along. So, would you rather be a powerful king or a wandering sage? Now, someone who figures prominently in our passage this morning, of course, is, is Herod. And this is a, an epiphany passage. We'll go into that in a moment. But Herod lived from about 73 or 4 uh, B.C. or B.C.E. to about 4 uh, A.D. And he's also known as Herod the Great and Herod the First, and Paul has spoken of him during, during the Advent season as well. He was a, a client king of Judea, and his kingdom was called the Herodian Kingdom. He is known for a massive building projects around Judea, but he's also known in this particular passage, or in, later in this chapter, of giving the order for the murder of the innocents at the time of Jesus' birth. Herod was no stranger to murder. In order to keep himself in power, he had three of his sons killed. He had uh, one of his many wives. He had a mother-in-law killed. He had two brothers-in-law murdered. And, and that, that's, those are the people we know about. <laughs> Caesar Augustus once famously said, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. Interestingly, scholars believe that Herod suffered from depression and paranoia. Had he ever been prosecuted for his crimes, he might not have been competent to stand trial. Well, granted, Herod is a bit of an extreme example of a powerful king, though he, he is still a model for a lot of rulers around the world even up until this time. Whatever degree of powerful king you aspire to, be it political, corporate, artistic, military, scientific, or otherwise, the downside is the insecurity that can creep in over the threat of losing power. Whenever any of us amasses any degree of power or clout, we generally don't take very kindly to losing it. But that insecurity often turns into an obsession. Witness Herod. Yet clearly, if you want to be a powerful king, nothing says that you have to be like Herod. So how does one maintain their power or sway over others? Well, in his disturbingly accurate book, and I often come back to this book that I hate, The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, he explicitly outlines the ways that a modern person can get and keep power. Law 3 reminds me of Herod's tactics in Matthew 2. Conceal your intentions. Green says this, keep, keep people off balance and in the dark by never revealing the purpose behind your actions. If they have no clue what you're up to, they cannot prepare a defense. Guide them far enough down the wrong path, envelop them in enough smoke, and by the time they realize your intentions, it will be too late. A person seeking power, says Green, is to throw others off by using false sincerity, sending ambiguous signals, setting up misleading objects of desire. Unable to distinguish the genuine from the false, he says, they cannot pick out your real goal. Now, when you read through Green's book, you realize that all of his 48 laws work in this world. They're disturbingly helpful. <laughs> what we conclude then is if we want power in this world, we risk being forced to compromise some, maybe all, of our most cherished values. Let us then at least, at the very least, admit that this quest for power has the potential <clears throat> to place at risk many of the values and beliefs that we have from Jesus Christ. So, would you rather be a powerful king 
or a wandering sage, a wandering wise man or woman. Quickly, a word about Epiphany, or Three Kings Day, or the Twelfth Day. It is commemorated on this day, and it's the twelfth day after Christmas, and this is where we get the twelve days of Christmas from. The term is a Greek word, and it means appearance, or manifestation, or revelation, and it refers to the the visit of the Magi to the Christ child. So when you think about it, it's through a pilgrimage by the Magi that Jesus Christ reveals himself to the Gentiles of the world. Wise people in ancient times pilgrimaged with gifts and honor for foreign kings, for places, for gods, and it was their way of affirming the holy in this world. And it still is. The fear of God, says Proverbs 1, the affirmation of the holy, that is, is the beginning of wisdom. So what exactly is the holy that we are affirming anyway? Well, I like what some people have said about this. Here's a quote from Warren Carter. The gospel tells a story of a prophetic figure who suffers the worst that the empire can do to him by uh, execution, by crucifixion. But his resurrection and coming to power expose the limits of Roman power. The gospel constructs an alternative world. It resists imperial claims. It refuses to recognize that the world has been ordered on these lines. It offers an alternative understanding of the world and human existence centered on God manifested in Jesus. Here's what Origen said way back. Jesus is the autobasileia. I love that word. It sounds like a a dance. The autobasileia. The kingdom in person. That great Jesus is the kingdom in person. If Jesus is the Holy One that we're supposed to affirm, how then do we affirm Jesus in our world today? So without saying more about that, let me just simply ask this question. If you would rather not be a powerful king, but you would rather be a wandering sage, what pilgrimage are you prepared to make for God in 2019 that you believe would affirm or honor Jesus? I'll just leave you with that question for the moment. Now on to our second, would you rather? Would you rather be guided by shrewd strategies or stars and dreams? Whenever world leaders uh, in ancient times felt threatened by the, their own people or by the kings of uh, other nations, they would take a variety of defensive actions and strategies to thwart that perceived threat. That's still true. Well, let's look again at Herod. Being a fearful man himself, who uses his power to secure power, he loses, uses fear rather to secure power. He does not like being caught off guard, doesn't like surprises. So after the wise men show up looking for the king of the Jews, Herod naturally seeks out those who are in the know, the priests and the scribes. They then direct him to Micah 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Ironically, then, it's Herod himself, the enemy of the kingdom, who directs the wise men to Bethlehem. So Herod's desire to keep from losing his own power turns out to be part of the beginning of the kingdom of the true king, gaining his power. And then when this strategy fails, Herod resorts to his old standby, violence and death. Then we get the slaughter of the innocents. Herod's order to kill the babies, all babies, two years and under, in and around Bethlehem. This is Herod's backup strategy to ensure that no one will ever threaten his kingdom or take it over. 
Stanley Hauerwas has said that Herod's brutal strategy, that, of that brutal strategy, that the death of the innocents forces Christians to be honest about the world that Christ has redeemed. It's true. The world's strategies for survival are often shamelessly ruthless. It lets us know, if nothing else, that we really do need a savior. You know, when I think about someone like the Burmese state counselor and Nobel Peace Prize winner, and I'm thinking I'm pronouncing her name right, Aung San Suu Kyi, for the life of me, I cannot fathom what noble end her strategy of persecuting the Rohingya people will accomplish for peace. I'm sure it's more complicated, more politically complex than I can possibly imagine. But doggone it, as clueless as I am, it sure does remind me of Herod. Folks, whenever we do make those connections between Herod and our own world, let us make sure not to forget those lessons. They are from the Holy Spirit. And do you know, we can find them almost anywhere. But still, wouldn't you be rather be guided by shrewd strategies of some kind, maybe not as extreme as Herod's, or would you rather be guided by stars and dreams? <clears throat> Wise people in ancient times, the sages, paid attention to prophetic writings and visions, to stars and dreams, and they acted on them. And they still do. People still do pay attention to the signs and wonders that they see in life. The wise men may have wondered as they wandered after that elusive star, but when it stops and when they enter into the hospitality of wherever Mary and Joseph were staying at that time, it was probably later, probably not in the stable, they immediately recognize the worthiness of Jesus as king. There is no question in their mind. The first two chapters of Matthew are filled with a host of dreams that guide the people, as well as that crazy star. I can't uh, point personally to one in particular, but I do know that I have had dreams, the significance of which were later revealed to me by God. But whether they are dreams or star. Haven't we all seen God place before us signs of his presence and his guidance? I bet all of us have at one time or another. A chance meeting, a random occurrence, a serendipitous conversation. Haven't we all seen these, star, or these signs? Friends, the wandering sage, the pilgrim of Christ, listens for that voice of the Holy Spirit in whatever form it might come. It might come in a dream. It might come in the stars. Or even against the man's own worst intentions through Herod. Trusting God's Spirit to give you a sign is a bit like discovering the Moki dugout. Now, I do need to see a show of hands. Does anybody know about the Moki dugout? Well, you're probably just not saying that. <laughs> well, 20 years ago, actually, I, I experienced the Moki dugout while driving a youth van from this church once. But uh, uh, the last time I think I was there was about 20 years ago. And just after emerging from 13 miles of dirt road driving through the Garden of the Gods, and yes, Laura, it was in your van, by the way, um, <laughs> onto paved Route 261, there was this out in the middle of nowhere bed and breakfast that I immediately wanted to stay at. <laughs> but I couldn't because I was looking for a way to get up to Route 241 to uh, Muley Point Road, which would then take me to Muley Point, from which I could see some of the goosenecks, though not all of them, of the San Juan River which are located just the, the, the main goosenecks of the San Juan, as you know, are located a few miles south of Muley Point. And all of this is, in, as I'm sure you know, San Juan County in, in Utah, just north of Mexican Hat. <laughs> now, I know some of you have been there. 
so there I am, just emerged from the dust of the crossroads of the Garden of the Gods in this two-barrel road eternity of Route 261. But I cannot see how I'm supposed to get to Muley Point from there. I'm looking, you know, standing in front of me is this flat face of a thousand-foot mountain, which go, the, the road apparently goes up to or through or around, and it just seems to disappear. For the life of me, I don't know where the road is going to go. Well, that's the way of the Southwest, you know, the mysterious land of enchantment and all that. So I just keep driving. And as I get closer to the flat wall face of that mountain, I begin to see patterns emerging on the mountain. And as I drive closer, suddenly it dawns on me that there is a road winding up the face of that mountain, like a snake. This, my friends, as you already know, is the Moki Dugout. <laughs> so when I reach the bottom of the mountain, I begin to climb that gravel road at five miles an hour over a 10% grade of narrow switchbacks, three miles up 1,100 feet to the top of Cedar Mesa, which has an elevation of 6,425 feet. From a distance, I had no clue how that road was going to take me up or through or around that mountain. Only when I simply trusted and kept driving did the way through become clear to me. Friends, that's how God works with the sages who will follow him. We usually have no clue how God plans to lead us through a test, a tribulation, an adventure, a pilgrimage in our life. But when you think about it, when was knowing the outcome ahead of time ever a, a prerequisite for us trusting God? The whole deal with God is that we learn to trust as we learn to follow. They go hand in hand. Friends, I don't know if you'd rather be a powerful king or a wandering sage, and, and I don't know if you'd rather be guided by shrewd strategies or, or by stars and dreams. But let none of us ever forget, we must make a decision about these things. In this new year before our Lord, we do not have the luxury of indecision. So, in 2019, even today, what will you choose? Thank you, Scott, and thank you for listening. From January 12th through the 26th, we are hosting 12 to 15 homeless guests through Interfaith Shelter. We need help with overnight hosting. Find lots more information at ljpress.org slash interfaith shelter. On Saturday, March 9th, we are hosting a mental health summit with keynote speaker Kay Warren. We'll need volunteers to make this happen, so if you are available to help out, please join us Sunday, January 27th from 12.15 to 2 and LC3 for an orientation luncheon. For more information about the summit or to RSVP for the luncheon, please contact Reverend Scott Mitchell at scottm at ljpress.org. You can find a complete listing of what's going on around La Jolla Press on our website at ljpress.org. That's ljpres dot o-r-g. Or call the church office at 858-454-0713. We hope you have a wonderful week full of many blessings and we hope to see you soon.